All right. Welcome back. And uh, congratulations for the brave among you who actually chose to get uh, another hour of this treatment. At any time you feel uncomfortable, there are two doors there, two doors there. There are doors also behind it. Feel free to scatter. All right. So before we dive into the next side of the, the presentation, do we still have questions? Anyone wants to ask their questions? Yes, please. Yes. The logout URL is the place where you want to go when, uh, um, when you are done logging out. Let me, uh, where is my pointer? Here it is. Yep. That's uh, where you want uh, when, uh, um, actually, let me take a step back. Say that you have your application and in another tab there is another application. The other application triggers a sign out. So in the middleware that I've shown, I've shown just the setting up, but the reality is that the stuff has other methods. Like if I want a button for signing in, instead of protecting this thing, I could have a sign in. The same class as a sign out method. So when I click that sign out method on the other application, this thing will take care of its own cookies, delete its own cookies, and then send a message to AAD saying, hey, I'm gonna sign out. And AAD will take the cookie, see all the applications that benefited from that cookie for creating a session, and uh, fan out messages saying, uh, you sign out, and you sign out, you sign out, again like Ofra before. And uh, at this point, what will happen is that uh, if, you are, if you specify this URL, you receive this message, and in this message you'll have the code in our middleware, which uh, handles deleting your own cookies and sending the signal to the next one. So that's what you use it for. If you don't populate this, I think we use some kind of default. But uh, um, what might happen is that you end up that your application is still signed in, as in you still have your own cookie, but the AD cookie is no longer there. So the moment in which uh, your session expires and the user try to get something from AD, uh, they will fail to do so. Does that answer the question? We are using the front channel OpenID Connect logout. Yes, sir. So it says that after you are done speaking, the user needs to instead of the user opt in, uh, needs to kind of perform this kind of thing. You should tell the method how to perform and possibly message it to you. Okay. It is technically possible, but usually that's not, uh, um, that's not necessary. Let's say that uh, if you go to the application and you say in Azure AD, this application requires 2FA, then uh, when uh, the AD re receives a request, then uh, there will be the uh, correct information here. So you don't need to do it from the app. Now, you can try to do this, but it's very difficult to manage. Let's say that normally it's the administrator which says, here, I want to use these applications, and for this app, I want to do X. Also, as an application, you don't really know what's available on the target. Like, I say that I'm an Office 365. If I say every time that someone signs in, do MFA, and someone that bought me doesn't have MFA enabled, what's going to happen? So technically and protocol-wise, that's possible, but normally you don't do this. Anyone else, anyone else, anyone else? No one else, good. So, all right. So let me ask a, a follow-up question. Um, you are talking about uh, this session, as in like I signed in and now I can access the app? 
let's say, are you talking about signing out or about revoking the consent? Right, so very different, uh, as an admin, you have no way to go today and target specific sessions. Like I don't have like a mega console which tells me all these users are now connected to X. I know about their session with me, as in like they're signed into AD or not. But then whether an app used it or not, uh, I don't get to that level of granularity. Now, if, use, if the applications are user consented, I can go find their, uh, um, how to say, find the entry which says uh, this user, this app, uh, this resource, delete it, gone. The user is no longer uh, consented. But if they have a token which is still valid, it will keep going. And a way in, in which you can have a bit more control for this is uh, when you create an application, you can also define roles. And then uh, when the application is acquired, the administrator assigns individual users or groups to those roles. And then at that point, if you want to take away the entitlement, you take away a user from a better role assignment. But again, it's not immediate as an effect. All right. And what I said earlier still stands. Anytime you want to interrupt me, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so now we are gonna talk about mobile applications. How many of you guys develop mobile applications? Some. And how many of you develop a desktop applications, like CLIs and stuff like that? All right, great. So for me, it's all the same. For me, a mobile app is anything that doesn't get uh, its content uh, served by a browser from a server. So that means that also a Cordova application or an Electron application, for you guys uh, knowing what those platforms do, are also mobile applications. Or like the CLI, PowerShell, uh, the, some bash extension commands, as long as it's not a browser serving content from uh, a server, it's a native app. So how does this work in Azure AD? Pretty straightforward. Here have my mobile application. I have my APIs, which once again can be different flavors. But for the time being, let's just stick to the Microsoft Graph API. What happens is that I need to register the app as usual, and then I'll have my client SDK and now comes the interesting part. The client SDK does a lot more work than the server-side SDK that we described earlier. It substantially does uh, two important jobs, three actually. One is it uh, uh, deals with all of the uh, protocol aspects, as in like uh, whenever you ask for a token for a certain resource, it figures out the Cartesian product of the platform you are in, whether you are signed in in a way or another, whether I already have uh, um, entitlements that I can use for avoiding prompting the user. So it does a lot of, uh, I would say, single sign-on math on your behalf, and then formats and chooses the correct protocol on your behalf. It's one. The other one is uh, it deals with uh, the interactivity component of the operation. As in, if I am on iOS, and I need to gather username and password and second authentication factor and consent, I have to show a browser surface of some kind. And that thing to code by hand, it's non-trivial and also has security implications because now if you have other applications on the device which can try to somewhat interject and steal your tokens. So this aspect has important implications. In fact, if you guys are working with iOS, if you heard what's happening with iOS 11, you have a feeling of uh, what I'm talking about. I'll go a bit more into the details in a second. The third thing that uh, our client SDKs do is maintaining session. That is, that is to say, remembering artifacts such as refresh tokens and similar, so that uh, whenever you come back to the client SDK and you ask for a token, and we either already have the access token cached, which corresponds to your requirements, or whether we have a refresh token that somehow we know, according to the rules that Azure AD uses, can lead to minting this new token without bugging the user again, we'll do this on your behalf. And we'll even, in iOS, Android, and Windows Universal, persist this stuff automatically. So that the next time that you open the app, the tokens will be there and will be nicely isolated from everyone else. You can see this in action when you use uh, um, components of the Office family on uh, 
an iOS or an Android device in which, uh, like very recently, I installed the team as I was coming down because uh, of the Microsoft people here are using uh, Microsoft team, I wasn't using it. I installed it, I launched it for the first time, I didn't have to sign in. I didn't have to sign in because they are using the same library as the rest of Office, and uh, we save the tokens in this uh, shared keychain, given that we are the same publisher, we have access to the same keychain, and so I had a beautiful experience, as odd as it might sound. So those are all the things that uh, we do with BAT. Now for determining how deep I need to go, how many of you guys, and please stretch your hand and keep it for a second so I can count, know how a refresh token works? Hmm, 60%. So sorry 60%, but you are not large enough for me to ignore it, so I have to show how it works. But I'll do it as fast as possible. So let's simplify. Let's say that you want to have a, an iOS app which gets access to the user calendar. So what happens is that uh, I make my API call for directly from the SDK, and they say that it's the very first time that I'm making this call. So once again, here I have uh, the two endpoints that I described earlier, the uh, authorization endpoint and the token endpoint, and the iOS app will pop out a browser. In the case of iOS, we use uh, the Safari View Controller, which is uh, a browser surface designed for that. If you are on Android, we use uh, the Chrome Custom Tabs, once again, functional equivalent on Android. If we are on Windows Universal, we use uh, um, the Web Authentication Broker, which again is a similar construct. If we are on Windows Desktop, then we just pop out a dialog with a browser in it, because uh, there is really no advantage in calling the system browser on the desktop. If you're interested, I can bore you after the session. During the session, it would be too deep. So we pop out this surface, we land on our authorization endpoint, we do whatever dance the authorization endpoint requires us to do, and we get back uh, a code. A code is just like a, a memorandum for the service to remember, yes, this user using this app consented to connect to this resource using this permission. It's just like a, oops, a lookup. And then we take this code, we play it against the token endpoint, and here it comes back to things like uh, credentials versus non-credentials. App uh, applications that run on devices cannot be trusted to protect keys, and uh, also distributing keys to the devices is uh, a nightmare. So we don't use them, and we simply give up on using the identity of the application as any uh, standard of access control. Like we just use this as a hint, but uh, we'll never make an authorization decision saying uh, because it's Outlook asking for it, because uh, we cannot be certain that it's Outlook. So we send this code and we get back uh, one access token and one refresh token. We also get an ID token, which I'm not showing for simplicity, which contains information about the user. If my iOS app wants to write uh, Welcome, Vittorio, on top of this thing, without having to make an extra call, they can extract this from the ID token. Now, I'm gonna be pedantic. The two tokens that this application just received should not be opened by the application. The re refresh token, because uh, it would do you no good. That thing is uh, encrypted for the service, so there's nothing you can do. Now, the access token might also be encrypted for the service, so you might also not be able to look into it, but today it isn't. But if you do, and invariably someone always does, what happens is that you take a dependency on a contract that you do not control. The content of a token is decided by the identity provider and the resource. You as the client are just getting it as a conduit so that you can gain access to the resource that you want. But if you take a dependency on the content of a token, your code will break. Sometimes it undercoverably so, because if we start encrypting it, there is no way around it. And it's always painful because uh, redistributing your clients means that uh, for two years to come, you'll still have your user saying, hey, my application stopped working because we didn't use it for X years and we didn't update. So please, 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 from a client, don't look inside the access token. This is not just for Microsoft, that's also for anyone. I won't, I won't say names, I just point in the registration. No one will know what I mean. So now what happens is that uh, whenever I needed to make my call, I will simply grab my, um, like do whatever REST call or whatever other protocol I want to use. We also use Visa for SQL and SQL Azure. 
So we use uh, one of the arcane protocols that SQL uh, uses for making boss calls. We don't know, we just give them the token and do, you do whatever, we don't care. So here it's usually REST, but it can be anything. And basically what happens is that we simply send it out and there will be some logic here that will uh, intercept and decide uh, whether they like it or not. Now this access token expires pretty quickly. It expires pretty quickly because uh, otherwise that would be a long, run, long running grant and say that uh, this thing lasts for five days and uh, I fire my user because I catch them doing something wrong. Now they have an entitlement which lasts for five days, which is not good. So what happens is that we typically make it last just one hour. In a short, you'll be able to control the duration uh, depending on your policies. And then once this expires, instead of popping again a dialog for asking for the user for credentials, we have this uh, refresh token, which we simply play back to Azure saying, hey, here there is a refresh token. I'd like another access token like the one you just gave me one hour ago. And if the user is still valid, if the consent hasn't been revoked, all these check that we can do, if there is no new policy which says from now on you have to do 2FA so you have to authenticate again, then we'll just get back uh, another access token which lasts for another hour and so we'll just uh, keep going. So now if I ask uh, how many of you know how the refresh token works? Yes, that's exactly what I wanted to see. The ones that didn't raise it, uh, I'll just assume that they fell asleep. Which is probably not far from the truth. Okay, very good. So we have uh, uh, quite the number of libraries. We have been doing this for half a decade. But the latest and greatest is this uh, MSAL. It's a new uh, set of SDKs, which is using the very latest version of our protocols. And uh, um, it has a number of interesting things, uh, as in like the programming model is much, much simpler. And uh, um, it uses these uh, modern uh, device browsers, which instead the older versions didn't do because those features, frankly, didn't exist on those various platforms. And uh, it reflects the fact that the new endpoints are uh, standard. Like uh, in V1, uh, we had to make some extensions for uh, accounting for some of the enterprise scenarios that uh, the OpenID Connect specification didn't really account for. But then through the years, we've learned how to simulate the same things using uh, scopes and similar. So now we are able to give the same functionality and remain completely standard. As a result, if you don't want to use an SAL and you want to use UpOff, or if you want to use any other open source library, you can. Be warned for what I said earlier, that uh, if you just take care of a protocol, then from the developer perspective, you are not even half of the way. Like you still have lots of other tasks, like managing the session. All the best demos that I've seen from our competitors, and sometimes also from us, to be honest. But most of the demos about this stuff, uh, they show you that they get the token, they call, everything works. That's fantastic, and everybody leaves to their cocktails. But if you run exactly the same demo one hour later, very often you get the dialog. So of course, that's, uh, I have to say, not usable. In production, that's completely unacceptable. Instead, if you use this stuff, uh, we already take care of this uh, on your behalf. Also, this thing works both with AAD and AAD B2C. And uh, we have uh, quite a sprawl of uh, platforms that we support. And uh, if your weekends are empty and you really don't know what to do, you can just head to github.com slash Azure AD. All those libraries are there. Feel free to feel bug, file bugs, add features like, to your heart content. And in fact, uh, for uh, the .NET version, we had uh, a very nice member of the community which uh, basically added the .NET core support all on its own. We just got it. Uh, we just had to review the code and say, yep, merge, fantastic. It's really good. Okay. So, <laughs> what? What happened? Now I'm uh, concerned. Now you have to explain what happened. iOS 11 broke Yes, it did. That's what I mentioned earlier. But iOS 11 doesn't exist yet. It's uh, an intention. Also, it didn't exactly break it. It just made it really, really awkward to use. You can still use it. It's not that it doesn't work. It's that you have to do a little dance uh, with a filler. And a certain, uh, uh, I have to say, enterprise scenarios will stop working. So still open. Yes, sir? Is this the HTTP 
uh, will this be a superset of uh, a dot? For French. <laughs> it's a long answer, so I have to see how much time I have. <laughs> no. Uh, it isn't really a superset. It is, uh, uh, functionally, it is an overlap. Let's say that it does uh, uh, basically the same things for the new endpoint. There will be things uh, that it will uh, not do. For example, and here I'm giving you the, just like we are going to Apple giving them feedback, saying please, please, please don't break the iOS 11 flow. Here, uh, one thing that uh, we are planning not to do is uh, to port the username uh, uh, resource owner flow in the two. So today in the one you can do the famous, infamous user, uh, uh, the resource owner password flow in which you just send a raw username and password and you get back an access token. There are lots of issues with that flow because uh, you cannot inject the um, MFA, you cannot inject consent, and uh, especially it invites really bad practices as in like gathering in the user space uh, credentials and uh, perhaps saving it so we really don't want to do this for V2. I know that lots of people are protesting, saying, no, no, we need it. So far, uh, the, the protest wasn't uh, uh, strong enough to convince uh, the architects to back out, but if you have a super argument, I recommend you deploy it as soon as possible. Yes, sir. Absolutely, the, that thing is more of a, like a, what happens in uh, this leg. Uh, not here, but uh, what's going on? Not here, this, like, the fact that the surface is slanted is making uh, this a lot of fun. Here, on these legs, it's really a matter between uh, the provider and uh, the browser surface that we show. So from the library perspective, we know nothing. This just occurs. And, uh, um, and then uh, the effects of these are reflected in the various artifacts that we get, but they remain opaque for us. Uh, so like for example, the refresh token that we get will maintain a used policy X. And so when we get new access tokens, they will also carry this thing. And then when the resource receives the access token, they love this thing. If your policy is uh, I only want uh, registered devices, then uh, simply the, the devices that are not registered will not obtain a token. Great, so let's take a quick look at some demos. Like for example, for example, um, which one do I want? Let me just open my project file and I'll pick one. So I'll just show you a super, super simple, um, not downloads, but documents. I will show you a super simple version of, uh, um, like an app which is using MSAL. And for some reason I like this one, which I did in Denmark. It's gonna be super, super simple. And before we actually see the code, I'll just show you a small representation of it. In, uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> it was easy. Not here, not here, not here, but uh, Sorry, I'm quickly losing control of this thing. Uh, we are almost there. Was it worth it? Yes, it was. Okay. Basically, when we develop this kind of application with this kind of SDKs, we try very hard to avoid imposing to the developer to understand protocol details. Also, let me speak in the microphone. So the idea is that uh, when you are on the service side, you need to understand a bit more of the protocol because you are defending your resource. So 
it's uh, harder for us uh, to abstract things away, and we try. We give you tools and similar, but ultimately, we don't want to hide from you the kind of protocol you're using because it's an important consideration. On the client, instead, you might be writing an application which uh, only needs identity for that little moment at the beginning and get it out of the way so that you can do the business function you want to perform. So if I would impose on you to understand all the of two constructs, all the uh, open and connect constructs and similar, the usage of the APIs that I'm suggesting would be really low because uh, let's be frank. Like, uh, if uh, like the, uh, the person in front of the door of a building you are working with speaks a language you don't speak and you see them only at the beginning of the day, you don't want to like, learn the entire language just for saying hi. Like, it's, uh, it, it's not something that uh, normally people want to invest unless you want to be a security expert, in which case then you can dig and similar. So our assumption is if in your mind regardless of whether you're an expert or not. In your mind, you have an understanding of a problem that you want to solve. If you go on the whiteboard and you draw that problem, all the blocks that you draw, those are things for which we want uh, a counterpart in our object model, so that it follows your intuition. And uh, we try to minimize the extra boxes which wouldn't be there. So in this case, in uh, the new libraries, the primitive that we give you, the main one, is your application. You start everything by creating your application. And the thing that you need to pass as the minimal detail is the identifier that you get assigned from the portal. So that's like the bare minimum that you need to do. And then, in order for you to make your call, we uh, define the permissions that you need to get. So in this case, I want to read the mail. That's the only thing I need to do, I need to know. And then we have application dot get me token and the bare minimum that you have to ask for is these uh, scopes entry, which basically just says, those are all the permissions that I want to use in my application. And what you get back is this authentication result, which contains lots of things, but in particular contains the access token. And then at that point you do my results dot access token, and then you use it using whatever protocol you want to use. And then behind the scenes, we just, uh, let's say, cache all the tokens for you, so we do all these uh, magic for which you have to think as little as possible. So that when tomorrow the application comes up, comes up and you make the same call, then you just get the tokens for free, let's say. Okay, so that was just for giving you a super high level idea. Let me close this guy so that I don't run out of memory. Okay. Wait, I opened the wrong one, sorry. Ah. I really needed to start wearing glasses or to get bigger, um, to get bigger, uh, um, bigger fonts. But then I would see less stuff at the same time. So that would be a lose-lose. So here I'll show you a super, super simple application which uses uh, uh, MSAL and basically does the thing that uh, I just described with one little twist. Let me select the relevant code. This one is the relevant code. So what I'm doing here is defining the things that I said earlier and defining, uh, as you can see in the lines, uh, of course, I forgot to add this other guy as well. Like uh, I initialize my class, as I said earlier, here my client ID. I define my uh, scopes that I want to use. And now, in MSAL, when you call acquire a token, we guarantee that you will always see a UI. In the past, uh, we had something which showed the UI only if it was necessary, which seemed a good idea. But then we observed that uh, in troubleshooting, developers had issues because they never knew it was, if it was supposed to happen, not supposed to happen. So in MSAL, we separated the two primitives. We have win acquire token, which is always interactive, and we have an acquire token silent, which is always silent. Let's say that uh, when you call that thing, we do our best to get the token that you asked for without showing any UI, which means we might have cached it, we might have a refresh token, you might be signed in on the device with a Kerberos user that can obtain this token automatically. So we try everything, all the tricks in the book. And if they fail, we raise this uh, UI required exception. And then there, you make this call. Now, this one runs on the, as an application that runs on the desktop. So, I'm not persisting 
the tokens which they are only in, in memory cache. So now we uh, will see that uh, when I make this call, there I have no memory of existing tokens. So my execution gets in here. I miss the times in which uh, laptops had one key, one function. Now instead, like they have one port, there is like one key with five different functions for getting. I just wanted F10, and of course it went page up. Sorry for the rant. So as you can see, I try, or as you cannot see because it's too small, I tried to make that line, but it failed because I have nothing in my, uh, nothing in my belly right now. So I'll now go in the cache and actually do my authentication. So let me just do F5. So I come out of this dialogue. Again, here I have a list of my users. And Mario has this password, I hope. Given that I use this thing many times, I don't get the consent because I consented about it in the past. And now, as soon as it manages, yep. This is a beautifully formatted email, as you can see. Now, I actually keep it badly formatted because it decouples me from a potential issue, which is, uh, this is a, an inbox which I never look at. It's a test user. You know that sometimes you get spam. You know that sometimes spam can be like uh, not appropriate to show on. Uh, so here, my hope is that uh, no one notices in case I get some, uh, one of those bad messages. Okay. So now at this point, if I click this button again, what do you expect uh, it to happen? Let's see. Who votes for I will be authenticated again? No one. Be brave. Who votes for I will get uh, authenticated without showing any UI? Okay, the ones that didn't vote, I, I don't judge. So moment of proof, succeeded. See, F10, I actually got my token without any popping, and now I have, again, the same call. So yeah, the, uh, the cache works. Now this one was a, a super simple example. Let me show you a, a bit more articulated example, which uh, will require more um, power from the machine, so it might not be super fast, but I think it's worth it. Now, the example that I'm showing you here is one of the samples that we have for the library, and it's using uh, Xamarin. How many of you guys know what Xamarin is? Few. Well, for others, Xamarin is uh, some kind of a magical incantation, which uh, allows you to write stuff in C Sharp, which is a fantastic language, and uh, run it on iOS, Android, Mac, and similar. It's just like the same code, and it magically runs on these other platforms. And uh, the way in which we structured MSIL, let me um, start this thing because it will take some time. And while it goes, let me talk about this. The way in which we structured MSIL is such that uh, when you create a project which needs to run on multiple platforms, why did you disappear? Basically, you need to create a solution. You need to create a solution in which you have one core solution which is shared across all, which contains uh, most of the logic. Like it's actually the total, near totality of the logic. And then you have uh, platform-specific uh, uh, projects in which you just go the last mile. Like for example, in Android you need to model things as activities. In iOS instead you have like your uh, main page. In UWP you also have pages but in a different technology. So, you just have the last mile in which you have the structure of a project, and uh, you typically need to add just a few platform-specific lines for specializing the flow to be used in that context. Like, for example, in, uh, um, what would be a good example of this? Like for Android, you have uh, the URL that you use for retrieving tokens, which is based on your package ID. Instead, uh, on iOS, it's based on the bundle ID and UWP is based on yet another principle. So here, you just specify different return URLs, but most of the code is in the main part. And this guy started, but didn't launch the app, so let me hit cancel. 
and then I'll just run it again and usually it works. So as you can see here, I have an Android emulator. So I just, happen, just happened to be debugging the uh, application that I'm using, uh, uh, for which I'm using Android. If I have a Mac, I could connect the Mac and show you the same on the iOS emulator. But I had a very short connection in, uh, for coming here, and I already had to stuff uh, my hand luggage with hair products. So I decided to bring only one laptop for once. And it, it is a, a true story. <laughs> it is actually true. So here I have the application. If I'd be running this on a UWP or a iOS, you'd see the controls changed. I have no merit for that. It's just the summary magic. And here, once I click sign in, given that I am on Chrome, and given that this is a, a version 25 of the emulator, so I actually can rely on Chrome in here, when I try to sign in, I actually get redirected to the Chrome custom tab. In iOS, this would be the Safari View Control. And as you can see, I'm already signed in. So I'm using one of the advantages that I described earlier, and this is one of the things that would stop working if Apple goes ahead with the iOS 11 change. So here, let me just say that I want to be Mario. Hey, voila, great. And now, potentially, I can just stop the app. Okay, app is gone. And now I want to launch it again. And given that it's Android, and given that I have isolated storage, I still have the, uh, the tokens cached. So now I should just come in and not have to sign in again already at startup. So this only, and voila. So this uh, takes away the, all the concerns about dealing with uh, sessions, and similarly, we do everything for you. So in terms of development, it really, really simplifies. Okay, very good. So now, let me just do a little sprint on, um, okay, I think that now we have something like 10 minutes left. Let's see if it's true. Yes, 10 minutes left. Okay, so here I'll be very democratic and uh, I'll give you a choice. We can spend the next 10 minutes talking about uh, Azure AD B2C or we can spend the next 10 minutes talking about uh, uh, the Microsoft Graph and AI. So, how many of you vote for Microsoft Graph and AI? And now I actually have to count, so you have to keep the arms up. Thank you. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29. All right, 30. And uh, um, who votes for B2C? You voted twice. <laughs> Uno, due, tre, quattro, cinque, sei, sette, otto, nove, dieci, undici, dodici, tredici, quattordici, quindici, sedici. Uh, you are less than out from the other ones. So let's do the following. Uh, I'll do the graph, and then I'll be available right outside. So if you guys are developers and the, the you want to skip the the app proxy, I'll give you like a private uh, session. And of course, I say it exactly as the speaker for the proxy works in the room. <laughs> I'll give you context later. Don't take it in the wrong way. Okay. Blah, 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 blah. Okay, the Microsoft Graph. So the Microsoft Graph is a, a um, I hesitate to say it, a facade. That's uh, a, the entry point for all things uh, programmable for cloud APIs in Microsoft. That's not strictly true. We still have services that have their own APIs that are not behind the graph, but that's where we are going. So that's a REST API, which you talk with using uh, JSON and in particular OData. How many of you guys know what OData is? Some. For everyone else, OData is an open standard. Microsoft did not come out of it. It's an open standard that uh, uses a uh, uh, definition of uh, URL and URI's entities to do things like uh, querying entities using JSON. So for example, I can uh, ask for a certain range of entities instead of downloading the entire list and then filtering uh, on the client, which is what would normally happen. So it's an advanced way of doing uh, queries using JSON, very, very effective. And, uh, this uh, single layer is a thing of beauty. Let's say that uh, until recently, you added, for example, to call the Azure AD graph, 
which only gave you user information. And then uh, you added to call like the exchange graph, which only gave you calendar and email information. And very often you want to do joints. Let's say that there are things uh, in one aspect, things in the other aspect, and you want to put them together. And uh, thankfully, the ideas were the same, but uh, it was much harder for you to compose things. Whereas now you can have a query which touches both in the same URL and just gives you back the result uh, nice uh, and smooth. Also, you have only one access token. If you're using our libraries, it, it doesn't change all that much because we have just a refresh token. And if you have the rights as the user to call two different resources, we'll just transparently give you the token. But if you are developing by hand, that makes a huge difference because uh, you need to make less, uh, less legs. Works nicely across MSA, so personal, uh, uh, let's say, personal users, as like uh, formerly known as LiveIDs, and working school accounts, so AIDs. All the things I've shown so far work on both accounts. So if you want to write something which sends emails, it will work both for MSA and for Exchange. And it has uh, like really, really interesting data. Like uh, thanks to the fact that we have all these intelligence, we can do things to the fact of giving you calculated properties, as in uh, people that are relevant to you, as in people that uh, edited the same documents as you, met with you, or that you answer an email from uh, within five minutes. So there are a number of like uh, machine learning uh, principles that are applied to extract this kind of relevant information, or like the documents uh, that you're using. This is not fi done for uh, Italians. We uh, need <laughs> to move our hands. So normally I'd be a little up, but okay. And just for giving you a feeling of this, here I'm using uh, the identity of the main program manager, which is far better looking than me. You know, that's why I'm using our picture. And uh, what happens is that uh, if you just want to get uh, the attributes of a user, you just do a get and you use uh, one identifier of that and you'll get your little JSON. And then uh, we have uh, navigational properties. That's what make these things a graph, the edges which connect all the various nodes. And uh, you can have like things like the, re the reporting chain, you can have the groups that you belong to and stuff to that effect. And now just to give you a super quick demo of this, which I'm very proud of, because I came up with the idea. So have, I don't know if you guys work for bigger companies, but have you ever been in a meeting in which you don't know half of the people and saying, who are these people? And uh, in, in Italy, we have a social clues, which will suggest uh, the relative importance, like the pay grade of a person. Like a VP will be dressed uh, differently from the DevOps. But in the States, that doesn't work that way. It doesn't, it's very frustrating. So, as I was thinking of uh, creating a, an app for demonstrating the use of a graph, I thought like, uh, why not using the cognitive APIs, which we use elsewhere, for, the, that we can use for face recognition and we can use also for training models, in which I can take, for example, all the faces of a certain group and then create this group of faces and then take images and say, is this image containing a face from this group? And then just use as identifiers of those entries the IDs in the graph of the entity, of the, pa of the people. And given that we all have pictures in our badges in Microsoft, I just trained this thing against uh, the, my boss. And so now I have like a, a cognitive model with all the faces, which just one image is enough. That's the thing that is crazy for extracting this information. And now I basically have a little application that I can use for um, recognizing a face see if that face belongs to a certain org. If it does, extract the identifier and then query the graph for all the information that I can get from the graph. So no longer making graphs with VPs because you think they are. Okay, so perfect. So here, let me just make sure that I train the model. Okay, so now this thing should recognize me. Even normally I have my hair down in my directory, I have a hair down, but it should recognize me anyway. Et voila. So what happened here is that I just used uh, this AI functionality for recognizing the face from this uh, training set, which I created again using the AIs. And uh, I took the outcome of these, well, I should have made a different face perhaps, and uh, uh, used this identifier to go and query the directory. So now you know my office, and you know also my phone, please don't call me at night. 
<laughs> Especially you in the recording, don't call me at night. Uh, and here, like, I don't have any colleagues, otherwise I'd show you that it works with everyone. But, and of course, like here it's half in zest, but you can think of this system as like, uh, when you forget your badge, you can go to a kiosk and the kiosk might print stuff out for you automatically without having to bug the receptionist. Or if you are searching for an expert in a specific uh, uh, field, you can just go to the cafeteria with this thing and search for all the people that belong to the list, uh, some are in developers. So there are many, many potential applications. Here I just uh, made it a bit lighter because uh, you guys have been super brave to go through two hours of this content. So I just wanted to give you a bit of uh, light stuff. Okay, so at this point, we have still three minutes for questions. And then after me, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we will have a session from Harshini and uh, um, Tarek who will describe the new thing that we came out with, with uh, Ping Identity, the usage of uh, AD application proxy with uh, Ping Identity products. And again, that will not be for developers. So if you are developers, you are warned. Do you have any questions for me? Yes, sir. So, the question is, uh, does MSIL work with any provider? Um, if you mean strictly MSIL, which is the library which is used for obtaining access tokens for calling APIs, then uh, that thing only works with uh, Azure AD, Azure AD B2C, eventually ADFS, and MSA. The reason being that there are many development tasks that go beyond the sheer protocol aspect, such as, for example, device registration, which is not codified in any standard, or usage of refresh tokens across different resources, which once again is not codified by any standard. So strict integration with uh, domain joints uh, or similar SSO solutions that you might have on your uh, hard disk, which again, don't follow any standards. You can, if you want, use uh, standard libraries against Azure AD, and, but not vice versa. Let's say that the MSAL is designed to Go as far as possible in making your life simple, but that means that we need to take into account and take advantage of some of the features that Azure AD provides. Now, when you're writing a web application or a web API and you want to protect them with Azure AD, you can, or you, can, you want to protect it with anyone else, then our server-side libraries, our middleware, works with anyone. Anyone that uses uh, OpenID Connect or OAuth with JWTs will work with our software. So, summarizing, if I am a client asking for tokens for calling a service, only AAD. If I am a, a, um, if I am a resource and I'm protecting calls, then anyone. But, yes, sir. So the question is, if I use ADFS and then I move to the cloud, do I need to change the client code? And they, uh, I needed to respond with another question. Actually, no, I don't need to. Uh, depends. Depends because uh, when you register your application with ADFS, you go to a, through a similar flow to what I described. You just use a console instead of using a web page. And in that case, you can specify the client ID that you want to use. So if you use the same client ID across both, then uh, you can reuse the same. The, you still probably need to change stuff here and there, like the address or the authority from where you want to get tokens from. So it's kind of like, uh, sure, you can do it, but it's more of like, hey, look, I, have a, I can juggle three, uh, three apples. It's not very, it won't change your life. You'll still need to touch the code anyway. Yes, sir. So the question is, uh, is there a way of uh, manipulating the length or the validity for the MFA session? And the answer is, uh, I don't know. I don't know because it's one of those things that uh, 
thankfully, doesn't change the code that you have to write. And so, as a good uh, lazy South European, I try to stick with an uh, area that I uh, am responsible for, and everything else has to go, ah, I don't know. No, that, that's not strictly true. But in this case, uh, it's true, I don't know. But I can find out for you. So I'll just give you my card, you can send me there. Yeah, very different mechanisms. Like uh, in a, just for refresh tokens, there is gonna be a feature regardless of MFA and similar, in which you'll be able to say the duration of the refresh token or the rules for which the duration changes. The catch is that uh, you have to use the paid version of the AID. So if uh, you have a basic version that you get, for example, by using uh, um, Azure or just like signing up for a, a directory, you will not be able to do this. You can today because it's in preview, but will soon Close the, close the faucet. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, drawbacks of using ID tokens for accessing APIs as opposed to using access tokens. Well, there are a number of drawbacks, as in uh, um, the, uh, the ID token normally does not have scopes, and scopes are the things that uh, determine what should, be, what should happen. So if you're using an ID token, typically you are talking to yourself, which is uh, uh, by design, it's not like a pathology, it's actually in the spec. But uh, uh, it really uh, makes sense in specific situations. Like for example, if I am uh, a, single page app and I'm sending a token to my own backend, it's simply that I decided to structure my app with uh, its head in, uh, in, on the server for the API and its uh, tail on the browser. And then at that point, it's still the same app, it just happened to stretch through those two things. But the moment in which I'm starting to wrap business functionality behind a service facade, I want to, of course, maximize reuse of this thing across the board. And so tying myself to a specific client means that uh, I will have uh, to have a different code for when my client calls me versus other people call me, which is technically possible, but it's uh, inconvenient because uh, now you are adding well, like, uh, one blemish in uh, the consistency of your approach. And the same goes from the client. Say that I'm writing a client which orchestrates call to that service and call to another service. Now the code I have to write for calling my own backend includes an ID token, when I call someone else, it's an access token. So different code. I needed to always keep this thing in mind. I don't really have the true fungibility that you would normally have with a service. Now, for expediency, given that it's easier to define one application rather than two, you'll see lots of people su like, uh, suggesting the use of ID token. Personally, I think it's always a losing proposition. Let's say that uh, for saving just a couple of clicks at the very beginning, you potentially have reports across your project uh, months later. So I, or if I have to call an API, I always try to use an access token and an ID token. Does that answer your question? But then you have an access token. <laughs> like a, a, an ID token is a token for yourself. If I needed to add, like it's kind of like, if I'm accessing myself, they were, they can, it's really fair game. I can do whatever I want to myself. I don't need to uh, have someone says, yeah, you have permission to do this, but not that. That's only when I'm accessing an API or a resource which is not myself. So it's kind of like everything is uh, technically possible, like the laws of physics allow for it, allow for it. but it's, I don't think it's just good uh, architectural hygiene to do it. And eventually you'll get someone on the project which has no context of why you did this, just reasons according to the protocols. The protocols say of an uh, off bearer profile uses an access token, so you'll want to use the access token. And that said, if you have more questions, I'll take them later because I don't want to uh, steal too much from uh, Tarek. So I'll be available also tomorrow at the booth if you have more questions. Thank you so much for your patience. <laughs>